Welcome to our second video in a series from Chapter 6, Section 1, Subsection 2. This one focusing on cross-sectional properties for structural design. We're going to learn that area, the cross-sectional area of a beam, is an indicator for the shear strength of the beam. We'll define another quantity called the section modulus which relates to the moment strength in beams. Then we'll define a third quantity called moment of inertia, which has to do with stiffness in beams. We sometimes call the area the cross-sectional shear strength, the section modulus the cross-sectional moment strength, and the moment of inertia the cross-sectional stiffness. These will be distinguished from other quantities such as yield stress, which has to do with moment strength also, but has to do with the stress capacity of the material, and then material stiffness, both of which are quantities that we studied having to do with materials in Chapter 4. We'll also talk about a quantity uh, uh, called the radius of gyration, which we mentioned in the uh, chapter on columns and compression elements is an indicator of the breadth of a compression element in resisting elastic instability or lateral movement of the column under axial force. The radius of gyration is very closely related to the moment of inertia or they are derivatives of each other in a mathematical sense. So beams that have a higher moment of inertia are also going to perform fairly, pretty well as columns, at least in terms of resisting buckling in the direction in which they have the high moment of inertia. If we take uh, a rubber beam and mark some vertical lines on it, so we have a red line down the center of this rectangular beam. If we draw two vertical lines, they're parallel to each other. When we lift the beam up and use its own weight as the source of load, we induce a substantial amount of curvature. These lines, which were straight to begin with, are still straight, but before they were parallel, now they're canted towards each other. Uh, if we actually carefully measured this, we discover there's no change in length along this red line. In other words, whatever we would measure on this straight line becomes what we measure on this arc. Uh, but the material on the top has shortened due to compression, the material on the bottom has stretched due to tension. Um, and if we drew this uh, slice out of the center of this thing, like so, uh, we could say here is the neutral axis where there's no elongation. The material is compressing on the top and getting shorter. It's being put under tension or stretched on the bottom and getting longer. And if we take a little slab of this material somewhere up here, uh, we basically say the strain or fractional deformation in that slab, in other words, the fraction of shortening in this case, is proportional to how far the slab is from the neutral axis. In other words, you get twice as much deformation there as you get there. Um, we say that the deformation is linearly proportional to the distance y away from the neutral axis. We've also noted that over the working range of most common structural materials, the stress is proportional to the strain, or more specifically, we have the formula stress is equal to strain times the material stiffness, E. So, if we know that F is proportional to the strain and the strain is proportional to Y, then we know that the stress is proportional to Y, and we end up with a stress block that looks something like this. High stress and compression at the top, going linearly to zero at the neutral axis, and then going linearly to a high tensile stress at the bottom. Now, I've drawn this cross section a second time over here with uh, some more detail um, to help us do some calculations and figure out what's going on here. Um, and so one of the things we've done is We've taken this compressive stress block and we've said from a, an equilibrium uh, a point of view, um, where is the center of action of that? Well, uh, 
It's clearly symmetric about this center line of the beam, so we know that whatever equivalent force, it has to be halfway between there and there. So it's somewhere along the center line here. Um, if you go back and look at your basic uh, geometry textbook, you'll discover that if you have a triangle like this one, and you want to find the, the centroid or the center of action of that triangle, it's actually one-third from the high end, two-thirds from the zero end. So in other words, if the overall height of this section is h, and then half of the section is h over 2, and then we go um, one-third of that down, that's h over 2 divided by 3, which is h over 6, and this would be two-thirds or twice as much as that, so this is h over 3. So we have an effective force, which is at the centroid of this stress block that it's replacing. And likewise, down here, we have a tensile force, which is at the centroid of the stress block here, which is the tension that's occurring in the bottom of this beam. Now, we have declared that these two stress blocks, which resolve into these two forces, C on the top and T on the bottom, represent the internal resisting moment for this element. And so we would like to do some computations and find some relationships between important quantities. Um, for example, we'd like to know uh, in terms of moment and cross-sectional properties what F sub B might be, because F sub B is the stress that we can't exceed without doing damage to the beam. F sub B is the maximum bending stress. It is often referred to as the extreme fiber bending stress uh, from the historical period when people were mainly looking at wood, uh, and we've continued to apply that terminology to other materials even though uh, steel and concrete and aluminum don't have fibers, uh, but you will often hear that term applied. All right, so we're going to do a little calculation here. We're going to say the moment due to this force couple, and these two forces are equal and opposite, so we can take either one of them and multiply times the lever arm between them, and that gets the moment due to that force couple. So M, in this case, is going to equal C times the lever arm between the two forces, which happens to be h over 3 plus h over 3, or in other words, 2 thirds h. Now, c per se is not a very interesting quantity to us, but we can re-express it in terms of one of the variables we'd really like to get at. Um, and the way we're going to do it is the following. We're going to say c is equal to f average times a over 2, where it's understood that A is the entire area of the cross-section. Since C is applied as a stress that's distributed over half of that, we're going to use half the area. And by definition, C has to be equal to F average times A over 2 um, by the definition of F average. So this is, you may not think to draw this or to, uh, to write this, but this is a no-brainer. It absolutely has to be true because F average will equal C divided by whatever area that force is distributed over. Now the interesting thing here is um, at the top, F sub B is the stress. At the neutral axis, the stress is zero. So the average stress over that block is F sub B over two. In other words, we can replace F average by F sub B over two. Likewise, we can replace area by the dimension B, which is the horizontal dimension, times H, which is the vertical dimension. So A becomes BH. Now, if we go take this C value and we substitute it in there, we get M is equal to um, F sub B over 2 times BH over 2. And then, of course, we still have this 2 thirds here. So that carries down to there. And when we clean up all this arithmetic, we get F sub B times 1 6 of the base times the height squared. Uh, 
This is the width of the beam at the base. This is the height of the cross section. And F sub B is the bending stress and M is the moment. Now, this is exactly where we wanted to get because we can calculate moments uh, from the imposed loads and figure out what kind of internal moment we need to resist. We can figure out what material we want to use, which will limit the amount of bending stress that we can tolerate. And then we can begin to play with these cross-sectional properties in order to find a beam cross-section that will keep this stress down to an acceptable level while still supplying the moment that we need. This quantity, by the way, 1 6 to the base times the height squared, um, that is a cross-sectional property we call the section modulus for this particular rectangular section. So S is equal to 1 6 times the base, base times the height squared. Um, and again, I want to talk about the elegance of this equation. This is all determinable by the spans and external applied loads. This is a material property. That's a cross-sectional property. It's an unbelievably clean equation where you can figure out that from your spans and loads. You can figure out that from your allowed material property. And then this is the pure cross-sectional property that you've got to determine. And in fact, for many materials, we tabulate for various different sizes and shapes what the section moduli are. So in fact, you can, knowing M and the stress limit, you can go find a section modulus and out of the tables grab a member. S is called the section modulus. Um, this particular formula applies to rectangular cross sections of width B and depth A. Um, any other cross-section has a different formula. So this would apply to solid song lumber, for example, but would not apply to a wide flange I-beam. Uh, the best common language descriptor of S is the strength of the cross-section in generating the internal resisting moment or the cross-sectional strength in resisting moment. So we have a little equation that I want to pull up here. M is equal to F sub B S. S is a cross-sectional property. This is a material property. And this is a moment which is imposed upon us by whatever decisions we've made about the spans and loads on our structure. Okay, so I want to talk about a collection of properties. Um, and some of these I've mentioned already, but cross-sectional area is the best indicator of the it's the crucial cross-sectional property for resisting shear force section modulus the technical term is sectional modulus we're going to try to call it cross-sectional strength and resisting moment uh, just to give more meaning to the term then we have something called a moment of iner inertia um, which we define as the integral of y squared dA over the cross-section. We'll talk in a minute about what that means. But the, it's called the moment of inertia. That's a very poor term. There's no inertia involved. Um, that's uh, a term that was drawn by analogy to another field of study that was occurring at the time that this phenomenon was discovered. Uh, I like to call it the cross-sectional stiffness in bending. And then there's a fourth term. If we imagine I, let's look at this by the way. This is inches squared, inches cubed, inches to the fourth. But every once in a while, we'd like to take something like a moment of inertia and come up with a simpler indicator of what that means. And in the case of columns, we can formulate all of our column equations in terms of I but it turns out to be much cleaner and much more elegant if we can find a single one-dimensional term that is somehow an indicator of what this means in the context of columns. And that indicator we have called the breadth in the column uh, chapter. If we take moment of inertia and just say by definition it's equal to r squared times a, we have all the dimensions uh, correct. It's i inches to the fourth um, or fourth power of linear dimension. And we can now solve for r. 
by saying, well, we're going to divide by a, so we have i over a, and then that would be r squared. When we take the square root, we get r. Um, the so-called radius of gyration, there's no gyration involved, but that's the term that got applied to it. We have been calling it the cross-sectional breadth in resisting buckling under axial compression, and we uh, have described that in terms of this ratio, L over R, um, as the slenderness ratio uh, upon which we can base determination of the failure stress or critical stress in the column. Okay, so I'm going to talk for a moment about what the moment of inertia is, or the cross-sectional stiffness in bending, and then we're going to talk about where you apply it and how it emerges in the process of design. But for right now, I'm going to talk about this general definition of the moment of inertia. For those of you who have not had calculus, uh, you don't need to understand this in its entirety uh, in order to move forward with your design thinking and your learning how to size things. But for those of you who have had calculus, um, this will be a beautiful illustration of the power and the beauty of mathematics. And this simple equation has been applied thousands of times to distill down data that allows you to look things up quickly in tables and size things really quickly. So it's a very powerful tool that you don't have to apply every time you do something but it's nice to understand how it was used uh, to set a foundation for what you're doing. So I've drawn a cross section here and we're going to start with a simple rectangle. Uh, it has a height H, a base B, similar to what we've been talking about so far. It has a neutral axis right through the center. We've depicted a little area, which technically I should call this delta A and I should go all th through all the derivative and everything. But I think most of you at calculus understand that whatever this thing is, it's a tiny little slice of area, which is essentially centered right around this line that's defined by the symbol Y. So we have a tiny little area DA, and we have a displacement of that area relative to the neutral axis. And that's what this equation means up here is that we're going to sum all these little slices over this entire cross-section, uh, taking y squared for each slice and multiplying it times the area of that slice. So that's what this integral means. It's just summing y squared times dA over this entire area. Now, We're going to shrink that down a little bit and make room for some mathematics. And again, for those of you who didn't get, do calculus, you can skip this. But I is defined as the integral of y squared dA. That means the integral of y squared b dy. In other words, there's a little dy that's associated with that area. And if we multiply the width b times that dy, we get b dy. And we're going to integrate that from y equals minus h over 2 to y equals plus h over 2. We can pull this b out because it's a constant, so we put it outside the integral. And when we integrate y squared dy, we get y cubed over 3, which has to be evaluated at y equals h over 2, and then subtract that off at uh, y equals minus h over 2. So we have b over 3. We've combined the 3 with the b. We're evaluating y cubed at these two limits. So we have b over 3 times h over 2 cubed minus minus h over 2 cubed. And then when you cube this, you get h over 8. When you cube that, you get minus h over 8, but this minus turns it into a plus. So we have h cubed over 8 plus h cubed over 8. And when we get done, we see that i is equal to bh cubed over 12. All right, so that's an example of how we would get i for a given cross-section. And then what we're going to do is we're going to just go check something, because you'll recall up here we said, well, if we start with this as our core definition, then s will be i divided by h over 2. And I'm now going to go demonstrate. <coughs> 
that if I take s is equal to i divided by h over 2, and we understand i is bh cubed over 12, so then we're going to divide that by h over 2, and then we're going to clean up units by multiplying the denominator by 2 over h. That means we have to multiply the numerator by 2 over h, so the denominator is now wiped out. This h will cancel one of those, so we end up with h squared. The b carries over, and then 2 over 12 becomes 1 over 6. In other words, s is equal to bh squared over 6. So this is exactly the same the result that we obtained using simple geometric arguments applied to a rectangular cross-section, that is, without using calculus. The calculus formula is formulation is much more general and more powerful, and it's capable of handling any shape. So in the structures business, uh, basically we start with the calculus formulation. Now, <clears throat> just to give you an idea of where we'd like to go with this whole thing, um, when we look at a rectangular cross-section like this, relative to moment and stiffness, this is not working very well because this material, this patch of material near the top, is, is working really well. It has a pretty high stress, which means a high force in it. It has a high lever arm relative to the rest of the section. And the same is true for the material down near the bottom. But material near the neutral axis doesn't have a very good lever arm and it doesn't have much force in it. So it's not making much contribution to the cross section in terms of the section modulus or the moment capacity, I should say, or in terms of uh, stiffness. So what we'd like to do if we have a material that will allow us to do this and steel and aluminum are examples of this where the shear stress capacity of the material is so high that we can cut away large amounts of the material that are anywhere near the neutral axis and move that material out to the boundary and create what we call flanges and so the evolution is that it goes from this to that. Now in the case of steel we have a limited number of sections that are actually rolled. Um, the machinery to set those sections up is very expensive, so you don't have an infinite number of different shapes. You have a pretty good variety, but not an infinite number. So we can use calculus for every single one of these shapes to tabulate what the section modulus is and what the moment of inertia is. And in fact, they even account for things like the little curved fillets in here and that would be a terrible nuisance to do on a one-off basis but it all gets tabulated and recorded and that data is available to us to use now one other topic i want to talk to talk about related to calculus um, we normally would draw gravity forces with down arrows so right here you see forces applied on the top because that's we know that's where the decking is delivering the force, but they are drawn with downward arrows. And then underneath we have reactions, which are the support elements that are coming up under the bottom of the beam. And those reactions are drawn upward, but they're drawn below the beam. On the other hand, we have adopted the sign convention that upward forces are positive and downward forces are negative. Um, and when we go to graphing, if we're going to do a proper plotting or graphing process, negative quantities should be shown below the horizontal axis and positive quantities should be shown above the horizontal axis. And that's what we've done in this drawing right here. So uh, as a graphing technique, we've simply taken all these down arrows and we've put them below the zero line because they're down and therefore negative and we've drawn the reactions above because they are inherently positive according to the sign convention that we've taken. Now, we can use the concept of integration to generate the shear curve. So what we do is the instant we step onto this beam, we suddenly induce a very large shear because of this reactive force. The shear goes from zero to some major positive quantity. From that moment on, we're accumulating negative area down below, and this starts to track downward. By the time we get to the center, we have just uh, used up uh, enough negative downward force to just balance that reaction 
and we reach a point of neutral shear. One side is not tending to move up or down relative to the other half, but then we continue to track down, we get more and more negative shear, and we have a high level of negative shear until we just step beyond this final reaction, at which point the reaction brings the shear back to zero, and then of course we have no shear out here because there's no beam out there. Now we can integrate this shear curve to get moment, so you'll notice lots of uh, shear right here means it rises rapidly, but as we continue to gather more and more area, it, we do so at a diminishing rate, and eventually we reach this point where uh, we're not accumulating any more moment uh, because there's no more area under the shear curve to accumulate. And in fact, we start accumulating negative area and it goes back down and eventually comes to zero moment at the end. Now, moment turns out is proportion to, to curvature. The more intense the moment you have, the more curvature you have in the beam. If you integrate the curvature, you get the slope of the beam. And if you integrate the slope, you get the deflection. So we started off at a constant, then we go to a first order equation, second order, third order, and fourth order. And this is where there are two interesting things that happen here. You'll notice this is an L to the fourth power for the deflection, which is a very powerful dependence which is why as soon as you start making beams too long or too shallow in their proportions, the place that it kills you is in deflection. It's really hard to make something really shallow uh, and really uh, stiff. We can make things that are still strong enough. So you can have things like a diving board, which you can make really shallow and make it really rubbery, but still strong. Uh, but it's this L to the fourth dependence that's really allowing that to happen, but it's also this L to the fourth dependence that's just a killer in terms of you got to make the beam deep enough and stiff enough that you can deal with that. And this is where I want to point out the moment of inertia, which we're calling the cross-sectional stiffness, enters this equation. And by the way, this deflection equation only applies to simple span beams subjected to a uniform load W. This does not apply if you have any kind of cantilevers or non-uniform W. The other thing I want you to note here is E, the material stiffness, and I, the cross-sectional stiffness, appear together. And that makes perfect sense when you think about it. If you're worried about the stiffness or the rubberiness of your beam, um, you expect the material stiffness to be crucial. If you double the material stiffness, you expect to have half the deflection. If you double the cross-sectional stiffness, you expect to have half the deflection. So you will tend to see, especially in this course, you will always see E and I occurring together because they are the stiffness quantities. They're not the strength quantities, and sometimes people get that confused because there is a correlation between the moment of inertia and strength, but it's only a correlation. The, the moment of inertia is the cross-sectional stiffness and not the cross-sectional strength. Now I know that's a lot of calculus we just threw at you, but um, it's probably worth getting that out there because you need to understand where these things come from. You don't need to calculate it in detail, but it's really nice for you to be aware that somebody has calculated it in detail, somebody has tabulated it, they have incorporated it into design tools, and these design tools allow you to rapidly size beams or size columns for any particular situation you might be dealing with. That ends our video on cross-sectional properties for structural design.